Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. It is good to have the orchestra back for another season. They, they lighten our, our lives and give us joy, and we're so glad to have them here. Uh, I want to welcome you and invite you to stand as you're able as we join together in our breakthrough prayer, and then we'll proceed right into this morning's call to worship. Both are printed on the front of your bulletin, or you can follow along on the screen. Let us pray. God of abundance, open our hearts and minds this season and always. Transform and send us into the world, growing in your spirit to cultivate your love and grace with boldness. Amen. Welcome to you, the weak and the strong. Welcome to you, sinners and saints. Welcome to you, forgiven and forgiving. At this time, I'd like you to remain standing, or I invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 98, To God Be the Glory. prayer. Let us pray. God of love and grace, bind us together this day. Even as you have welcomed us, so may we welcome one another. Speak to our hearts that we may hear your words and heed your call to live as a community of acceptance and love. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Please take a moment to pass the sign of peace with those around you. So today is a special day in the lives of some of our students here at St. Mark's. Our third grade students are going to be receiving Bibles this morning. So I'm going to invite uh, Jackie Rao and Jen Cawthorn to come forward. Uh, and while they're making their way up, I think we have a video to watch. Welcome to the recognition of this year's third grade class. The United Methodist Church has been giving Bibles to third graders for many years, and it's a good time to remember that these third graders are the future of our church. We pray our church is regularly letting them know how special that they are and that they find joy and spiritual growth in our programming here at St. Mark's. This morning, we're excited to give Bibles donated by the United Women in Faith to the third graders of our congregation. And at this time, I would like to invite the UWF representatives who will be handing out the Bibles, Barbie Schmenner and Beth Montag. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, third graders, as you hear your name called, please come forward. And um, we're going to have you stand up here on the podium since we're a little full down here this morning. <laughs> and after all the Bibles have been presented, the pastors will offer a, a word of prayer over you. Jace Beagle. Ramsey Blake. Nicholas Bridenstine. Jesse Brinkman, Adeline Burton, Jacob Dobson, Lizzie Geis, Sam Harbeck, Charlie Kelly, Corinne Melvin, Samuel Powers, and Natalie Taylor. I'm sure a lot of you are the same as me. I still have my third grade Bible and I still keep, I keep it in my office here and I look at it often so I hope that you all do as well. Keep it for the rest of your life and take it to heart. Let's, I'm gonna pray over you guys if that's okay real quick. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and for the promise that it brings us. And we ask that you open the hearts and minds of these third graders so that they have a curiosity to, to read your word and to learn all about it. And may these, the gifts of these Bibles plant the seeds that will grow their faith in the years to come. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. So I'd like to take another moment uh, to welcome you all again um, and to invite you to take a moment to, to pass the blue attendance sh uh, pads that are at the end of your pews if you'd like to mark your attendance that way. You can also do it online at stmarkscarmel.org slash attend. We're just glad that you're here uh, and this would give you a place to let us know that you're here 
as well as let us know of any pastoral needs that you may have. I would also like to draw your attention to some of the upcoming events that are listed in your bulletin in the blue section. I'm going to steal a line from Pastor Carla. The first, first line is, the pumpkins are coming. <laughs> this is something near and dear to my heart as a director of student ministries. We are taking on the challenge of a new fundraiser this year. We're going to have a pumpkin patch. And when I say the pumpkins are coming, I'm not joking. It's going to be a big semi-truck, and it's due to arrive on October 8th, uh, right after the 11 o'clock service is scheduled to arrive at noon. Hopefully it will. Um, and we will unload them and build a pumpkin patch right outside here and sell pumpkins uh, October 8th through October 31st. And we need help. We need folks to help us unload that truck. We need uh, folks to help uh, sell pumpkins throughout. Maybe we have, we'll have a sign-up with sh- uh, shifts where you can sign up to help sell, uh, especially during the noon to 4 o'clock hours when the kids are still in school. It would be a little hard for them to sell pumpkins when they're in class. Uh, Also spread the word and and buy your pumpkins here this year. Spread the word to your neighbors that we have pumpkins for sale. Uh, The other thing I was going to say is, along the same vein, Holy Walk is coming. I I was thinking I was going to say the Romans are coming, but it's more than just the Romans. (laughs) Um, As many of you know, I'm always a Roman guard in Holy Walk, so again, that was my first knee-jerk. But Holy Walk is coming this year. This year is a Holy Walk year. Uh, we will be having sign-ups coming up, I think, next week, if it says in your bulletin when they start. Uh, but it will take the entire church, if you haven't been through it before. It's an amazing experience, and I'm really looking forward to it. And then the Holy Land is coming. <laughs> there's a trip to the Holy Land in April that Pastor Carla is leading, and uh, there's information in your bulletin about that. I know that she's really looking forward to it, and I'm, I'm going to admit a little, I'm a little jealous that I'm not going to be able to go. But... In addition, there are numerous numerous ways that you can serve that are listed in your bulletin as well, uh, and I invite you to take a look at those as well. This morning's epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. You can find that in the Pew Bible, New Testament, page 163, or follow along on the screens. Welcome to those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in the honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. This is the word of God for the people of God.
So we're going to take a time of prayer at this point, enter into a time of prayer. And as we usually do, we will start out with a time for some silent prayer. And then I'll lead us in a, a prayer and end with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks, O Lord. We call on your name. We will make known your deeds among the people. We'll sing to you. We'll sing praises to you. We'll tell of all your wonderful works. We glory in your holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek you rejoice. We seek you, Lord. We seek your strength and your presence continually. We remember the wonderful works you have done. We remember your miracles, the judgments you uttered, and the forgiveness you have given. We confess that we struggle to forgive, and we struggle to create space for forgiveness to happen. We rush ourselves to excuse the harmful speech and actions of others as a way of suppressing instead of honestly naming the hurt we have experienced. We expect expect others to pardon our faults without also attending to our own need to repent. We demand forgiveness from others instead of recognizing forgiveness as a gift we give to one another and that we receive from you. We wield forgiveness as a weapon instead of a bridge that brings us back together. Forgive us, we pray, and free us to joyfully extend mercy and grace to one another, to set and respect boundaries with one another, and to receive from you the love and wisdom we need to grow as the community of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission focus for September is the Society of St. Andrew, while it is also National Hunger Action Month. Over 70 million people in the U.S. today are hungry or are food insecure, while billions of pounds of good food each year end up in landfills. Society of St. Andrews, SOSA, works to reduce food waste by harvesting healthy food for families in need. Potatoes this year cost an average of 89 cents per pound. Last year, St. Mark's partnered with Sosa and provided 40,000 pounds of potatoes for only 16 cents per pound. Please help us reach our fundraising goal of nearly $7,000 to host this annual potato drop on October 21st. You can support this nourishing mission with financial donations online at stmarkscarmel.org slash give or use the offering envelope and the blue attendance pad. Because you give... St. Mark's gifts. Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us so much to us in love and joy. Every good thing in our life reflects your caring. Even in the giving of our offerings, we have tried to give our best, but know we could do more. In a world where forgiveness has become a rare commodity, 
It is often an asset we hold back to maintain power over one another. Help us to hear the teaching of Jesus and the generosity of forgiveness. May we learn to give that to others with wild extravagance. We pray in Christ's name, who gave all. Amen.
remain standing as we hear this morning's gospel lesson, which comes from Matthew 18. We've been reading through the gospel of Matthew in the last few weeks. And we come to a time where uh, Peter asked Jesus a question, a question I suspect many of us may have wanted to ask at one time or another, and Jesus responds with a sort of a short answer and then a longer story. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with you, and I will pay you. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then this Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As I mentioned a moment ago, in a lot of ways, this is a question that uh, probably all of us have asked ourselves at some point. I mean, how many of you have someone who uh, just annoys you? Not to put too fine a point on it. And over a period of time, you come to the place where you think, how many times do I have to uh, be patient or forgive this person for doing these things? And uh, so Peter comes to Jesus, and he's asking Jesus that question. And, and Peter says, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive him? As many as seven times? So here Peter clearly is thinking, he's being generous. Seven times, Lord. I'm, and and I, I think that probably Peter expected Jesus to say, why, Peter, that's pretty magnanimous of you. Seven times forgiving someone, that's, that's a lot of times. You're doing a great job. But instead, Jesus says, not seven times, but uh, some translations say 77 times. Some say seven times, 70 times. Either way, it's a lot of times and more than we're probably going to keep track of. And so Jesus uh, uh, kind of gives him an image for the forbearing grace of God. And then he tells a story. And a lot of times Jesus does this. He'll, he'll answer a question and then tell a story to, to kind of get the punchline home. So he tells a story about a king who has a servant who comes, and the servant comes to the king and says, uh, the king says, you owe me 10,000 denarii, which is an unfathomable amount of money uh, that, that no person could repay. It's like if we got into debt up to a million dollars. You know, most of us are probably not going to be able to pay a million dollars in debt. And so he says, uh, he's got this unreasonable amount of money, debt, he owes the king. And it's interesting because the servant, when he comes and talks to the king, notice he doesn't say to him, uh, Lord, please forgive my debt. Let me go. He says, I owe you a lot of money. Have patience, and I will pay it back to you. So you would expect that the king at that point would say, okay, I'll give you a few extra months, and let's see if you can pay this back. Well, it was an unreason- there's no way he was ever going to pay this money back. But the king instead says, because you have humbled yourself before me and asked for forgiveness of this, I will forgive you the entirety 
of the amount that you owe. You see, the king is being more generous than even he was asked to be. So you would think that someone who had just experienced that level of generosity, they're going out the door. What do you think their attitude toward other people might be? Do you think they might be generous to other people? Certainly that's what I would expect, but not so. So this uh, servant who's just been forgiven a great debt meets one of his fellow servants on the street who owes him a small amount of money, a reasonable amount of money, amount of money that could be paid back. And this person makes the same plea to him that he had made to the king. He says, uh, please uh, have patience with me and I will pay back your debt. And, uh, and he says no, and he puts him in prison until he pays his debt. And I have to say, somebody asked me after the first service, and, and this is a reasonable question, exactly how is he supposed to pay off his debt while he's in prison, right? I don't know. I, I, but uh, so there's, there's an unreasonableness there. So the friends of these two servants who owed money saw what happened, and they come back to the king, and the king says, that's not right. And so he puts the first person uh, in prison and says, this is the way it is. If, if I forgive you and you are unwilling to forgive other people, then I'm going to withdraw this, this forgiveness. And so we're meant to, it's meant to be kind of a morality tale in which we come to some conclusion. And so what might those conclusions be? I want to kind of maybe talk about that just a little bit. So, as I began by saying, Peter, you know, asked this question, which is probably a question that many of us have asked God or asked ourselves, you know, how many times. And I want to say up front, you know, Jesus clearly says you should forgive a lot of times, but that doesn't mean that we are meant to let people take advantage of us. Those are different things. So, forgiveness uh, doesn't mean that you willingly let someone abuse you or mistreat you, or it means that you, you, you still might want to withdraw yourself from that situation. It doesn't say the king said, okay, I'll loan you another million talents, but it does mean uh, in this case that we have to come to terms with things that people have done to us and how we might offer forgiveness to them. Not so much in many ways for their sake, but for our sake. It may be hard in some level for us to hear this message because many of us have people that still have done things that make it hard for us to uh, forgive. Roberta Bondi uh, says that believing... Uh, one is perfect enough to criticize another person is self-righteousness, the sin of the Pharisee in the temple, not perfectionism. Self-righteousness is the opposite of love. Now, we talked about love a couple weeks ago or last week and talked about the opposite being self-centeredness, but self-righteousness is sort of a corollary of that. And so, uh, What's going on in this story and what is Jesus' answer supposed to mean for Peter and for us uh, today? First of all, uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, in the New Revised Standard Version, it says, Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Now, that's not a really uh, accurate translation here. It really should, it, it says, if my brother, or we would read this as, if another person sins against me, how often should I forgive them? The church didn't exist at the time of the writing of the Gospels, so uh, that's kind of a a later editorial translation. But the, the point is that Jesus, even from the beginning, and the Gospel writers, even from the beginning, knew that people would have times when they had difficulties getting along with one another. Jesus could have said, why are you talking about forgiveness? You all should be getting along just fine without any problems whatsoever. Uh, And yet we know that anytime groups of people are together or families or coworkers, at some point we're going to rub against each other and need to reconcile through the process of forgiveness. 
The other thing I think that we have to focus on in this is that forgiveness, we think uh, forgiveness is something we do to release the other person. But in reality, many times, forgiveness is something we do to release ourselves from the emotional captivity that we have in a given situation. And so, one, one writer has says, uh, holding resentment, not forgiving someone, is kind of like drinking poison yourself and expecting the other person to get sick. It is really a, a toxic activity for us. So forgiveness means to release, to let go of the other. Forgiveness is not denying our hurt when we minimize what has happened to us, gloss over it, or tell ourselves that it was not really that bad. We cannot really forgive. The first step in forgiveness is to acknowledge that something happened. And then there is this sense in which Jesus reminds Peter that forgiveness is an ongoing thing. If we live together very long, at some point, uh, something's going to happen that uh, needs forgiveness. And I have found in my personal life that uh, the sooner you do the forgiving, the better off you are. It's holding on to resentments over time that causes people uh, difficulties both emotionally and spiritually. And so, uh, I, over the years as a pastor, if I were to identify uh, the, the uh, reasons that people come into my office for pastoral counseling, I would say that 90% of the time, and maybe that, that's probably a low estimate, that over 90% of the time, people need either one, to be forgiven by someone, or two, to forgive someone else in their life. Forgiveness is so critical to our spiritual and community well-being. However, God's mercy doesn't really erase our responsibility for our situations, and so forgiveness doesn't mean that we, we give uh, everyone a release from all responsibility. But in this story, Jesus talks about the generosity of God's grace and how that generosity should, in fact, call us to extend grace to others as well. Not, not as an act of emotion, but as an act of disposition, that we have a will to forgive others as God has forgiven us. And so, a few years ago, there was a book uh, written by a rabbi, Harold Kushner, called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And later on, Harold Kushner wrote about forgiveness, and he tells this story. He says, a woman in my congregation comes to see me. She is a single mother, divorced, working to support herself and three young children. She says to me, since my husband walked out on us, every month is a struggle to pay our bills. I have to tell my kids we have no money to go to the movies while he's living it up with his new wife in another state. How can you tell me to forgive him? Rabbi Kushner says, I answer her saying, I'm not asking you to forgive him because what he did was acceptable. It wasn't. It was mean and selfish. I'm asking you to forgive because he doesn't deserve the power to live in your head and turn you into a bitter, angry person. I'd like to see him out of your life emotionally as completely as he is out of it physically, but you keep holding on to him. You're not hurting him by holding on to that resentment, but you're hurting yourself. As we think about forgiveness, it's something that we do first because God forgives and we want to model God's behavior, but we do it as well because we know in the long run we are better off and healthier uh, by forgiving others as God has forgiven us. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Forgive us our sins or trespasses as we forgive those who sin or trespass against us. That, uh, that clause in the Lord's Prayer reflects this idea that God's forgiveness is related to our ability to forgive other people. 
A few years ago, uh, I read a book by Roberta Bondi, which I mentioned earlier, and in that she uh, describes Dorotheus of Gaza, who was a 6th century monk. And Dorotheus of Gaza lived in the monastery. Now, you would think that a group of people living together in a monastery would get along with each other. But the reality is that it's a group of people and a group of divergent personalities, and and they're not always going to get along. And at one point, Dorotheus was frustrated with his brothers in not getting along with one another, and he gathered all of them together, and he drew on the wall a circle, and he put a dot in the very center of the circle. And he said, this dot represents God, and this circle represents all of us Uh, gathered here as if we're standing in a circle. And he said, can you not see that if we, if we move from the perimeter of the circle toward God, toward the dot in the middle, that we cannot help but being drawn closer to one another. And as we move further away from one another, we cannot help but walk further away from God as well. That these two things are intrinsically connected to one another. And so when we think about this story that Jesus told and this whole teaching about forgiveness, we, we see that our relationship to God and God's forgiveness cannot be separated between our relationship to those around us, that they are bound together. And so if we think about it that way, we realize that as we experience the forgiveness of God, we cannot help but extend that same level of forgiveness to others around us. The attitudes and behaviors that Jesus expects of His disciples are modeled on who God is and how God behaves. The God of Jesus and His disciples is a forgiving God, a reconciling God, and a God that will do all that is possible to save each and every one. Failure to forgive is not just bad form or something God frowns upon. Failure to forgive is failure to be like God. Failure to forgive digs out a massive gulf between us and God. When we fail to forgive, we walk toward the perimeter of the circle, we walk away from God, and we walk away from one another. The, the parable turns in the end on us as it surely did on people, on Peter, uh, how can you ask such a question, how often should I forgive? As the church, we should know better, for we should know how much we have already been forgiven. That perspective enables the church's ongoing practice of forgiveness. One of the pieces of liturgy that we don't use as often as maybe we should is associated with a uh, right before the, the prayer of thanksgiving for Holy Communion. And I'm going to invite you where you were sitting, if you'd take the, the hymnal out of the pew rack in front of you and turn to page 8. There is there a litany for forgiveness and p- confession and pardon. And I'd like for us to share together in this litany as a reminder that God has forgiven us, and I'd like to share it also as a reminder that we are called then to go into the world and forgive others in God's name. So let us share together in this confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I want to invite you to a moment of silence in which we offer our petitions for forgiveness to God, and we accept God's forgiveness. And now hear the good news. 
Christ, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we have received God's forgiveness, let us go and extend God's forgiveness to others. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, There is a Wideness in God's Mercy. Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. Let us go in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit to take God's grace and forgiveness into this world where people need a word of mercy and grace. Amen. Amen.